In our first story, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata has debunked claims by Senior Minister Yawasafo Mafo that the Heritage Funds could be used to finance government's flagship free senior high school policy. There's been huge public outcry over the former Finance Minister's position with some civil society organizations calling on government to reconsider its position on the fund. But the Finance Minister, in an interview with Joy News, says the Senior Minister's uh, the senior minister cannot be right because the heritage fund is not part of the options being considered by government in the funding policy. We are financing um, the free SHS education without looking at the heritage fund. So government should not touch the heritage fund? We are not touching the heritage fund. He, as far as I know, he alluded at looking at all the options for us to be able to finance education. I'm not sure we are considering that. I think we have enough resources from our envelope to be able to do it without touching the Heritage Fund. I don't expect us to. So you are saying that we will not touch the Heritage Fund as far as I do the not, funding of the free senior higher education is concerned? We will not touch the Heritage Fund for the senior high school program that the president has is that right now. There is going to be a budgetary allocation for that. And it does not include the Heritage Fund. So you know, we, we, we have to listen to the budget. I can't be revealing all sorts of things here. You know, there's still a lot of work to be done before March um, 2nd or so. Uh, and so you, you hear what we're doing. Can you tell us one of the imaginative risks you're going to take to fix the state of the economy? Well, I mean, first of all, people are even disputing the fact of tax reliefs, for example. You know, and we are going to do that. Uh, we are not going to touch the Heritage Fund to be able to support um, the free SHS education. That would also uh, be done. Um, we need to be uh, also quite bold about looking at um, huge projects such as railways and co and how we initiate um, the development of those things which will open, open up the country. Um, so, and there are a number of other programs that we are thinking of for that. Um, so, for me, yeah, um, the things look grim, but um, those are just the facts of the matter. The truth is that we are very strong entrepreneurial people. Um, we have confidence, and we know that by freeing economic space for the entrepreneur, they will deliver to give us the resources for the future. Now, the Police Criminal Investigations Department says its investigations found no evidence that national organizer of the NDC, Kofi Adams, stole state vehicles. Five cars were seized from the residence of Kofi Adams. He was subsequently accused by the Deputy General Secretary of the NPP, Nana Obribwahin, of illegally possessing the vehicles. Mr. Adams had threatened to sue the police if they failed to release the vehicles. Lawyer for Kofi Adams, Samson Ladi Ayenene, confirmed his client has received all the cars, but says they are now ready to sue the NPP Deputy General Secretary, who has refused to apologize for defaming the NDC national organizer. And indeed, this controversy also brings into question the kind of procurement system Ghana has. Is there a problem with the country's system when it comes to procurement and presidential transition? Let's talk about this. I'm joined in the studio now by Dr. Ted Afote Waters. He's international consultant, competition law and public private partnership. Thank you very much, Dr. Waters, for joining us in the uh, studio. Thank you for having me. And good morning to good you. Good morning. First of all, we want to find out from you, is there anything wrong with our procurement system with reference to Kofi Adams' case, for instance? Yes, uh, good morning. Um, I, I think that uh, there is a bit of a gap in terms of the way the whole process was handled. Because if you look at the procurement process, typically when government acquires vehicles, all the reference information should be stored up in a specific database. And the transition law makes it clear who should be responsible for handling this um, information. And I believe that if we have the database for all the procurement of vehicles that government has done, it makes it very easy to know where they're located, who has it at any given time. And then the question of just picking on people like Kofi Adams and 
for all of us to later realize that it is not part of the loot, I must say, mm. wouldn't have happened at all. So there is a bit of a gap in the way the procurement process was managed. So we'll talk about the database you just mentioned, but what does the law say in terms of processes like this? Yes, the law is very clear to say that after the creation of the um, transition law, it pushes the procurement of, of these assets to the uh, Administrator General's office that whatever government needs to work with should be procured from there. Apart from that, other uh, MDAs, ministries, departments and agencies also have uh, qualified procurement departments which are responsible for acquiring those items. Now, when we go through the real process to get those items here, it's only proper for us that these items are documented and referenced to the Administrator General's office, who now takes records and custody of all these things. It's movement, transferring, receiving them from an outgoing president and transferring to a new regime should all fall at the doorstep of the Administrator General. And that would have solved uh, some of these challenges that maybe might have Mm. Cropped up in the but in this case, we have the Administrator General, David Yarrow, telling us that uh, as at the time of the transition, he was aware that over 200 vehicles, according to the documents he had, had been given to the new administration. But we later got to know that this is actually not the case. And that is where these you know, controversial issues came up. And you talked about database. What do you think is the problem with the database? Good. The problem, I'm sorry, but I think the problem might be largely at the Office of the Administrator General because the Administrator General's responsibility is very clear that he should take custody of these items. Now, if an outgoing government is to hand over assets, it's, it's not to hand over to the incoming government. It should hand over to the Administrator General. That is what the law says. And then the Administrator General hands it into the incoming government. So if there are any gaps or in terms of shortages, it is the Administrator General who should know. He should not just be a back and be informed of what has actually gone on. But he is the center of managing the whole process in terms of government assets and who receives what and what are the gaps in it. So um, I think that there is a bit of a gap in terms of the Office of the Administrator General's um, role. In fact, if we had managed that technocratic role properly, we wouldn't have given the space to politicians to you know, come in. There are, the politicians have their own stance. There are doubts, mistrust, and everything. So. Where they realized that there was um, a gap of space, then they had to fill it in. And probably they may even want to make a case when there's no case. When there's no case. Visual yes. with politicians. Exactly. So if Administrator General had done it properly, nobody would have spoken. Because he would have identified where the shortages are and who would have announced what actually he has given to the incoming government. And that is what is going to be documented and signed on. And for you, you support those with the opinion that the Office of the Administrator General might not have done due diligence as expected of it. That is correct. That is correct. Now, that is a school of thought I have. Mm, you've, you've just spoken about database, which is the problem. But what other challenges are there in terms of dealing with the process and ensuring that everything is done perfectly. Thank you very much. Now, if, if the Office of the Administrator General, what he does is to take stock of all government assets. So he has the responsibility to liaise with all the logistics officers, all the transport officers, estate officers, to know what government assets are, there are. And then he would have to build the database. It could be just a, a simple Excel sheet which covers all these institutions. And then day after day, where we add on to it, he would also add them on where we have to um, dispose of them. He reduces them and document them so that he should have 
the first information, first-hand information than anybody else in the country because that is his role. You, you keep mentioning the Administrator General. Is he the only one who is supposed to ensure that everything is done perfectly? Are there, are there not other departments and persons in the chain to ensure that this is done properly? Well, you have his supervisor who would have to ensure that he performs very well. But, you know, just as, for instance, if we look at, if we come into a ministry and there is a contract awarded, straight away I can tell you that let's go to the procurement office because he will have to answer. If he says, my boss asked me to do it, it is your responsibility, not your boss's. So the, his role is very clear. So if it is managed properly, then maybe it takes uh, some of these challenges away of the whole system. I, I must confess that, look, if that process was managed the way it should be, it wouldn't have given credence to anybody at all to challenge anything because everything would have moved as planned. But where we don't have the database, we don't have records, then the assumption is somebody is taking out something. So what do you think is the problem? Is it a law or the problem is human? It is not a law. The law is very clear. It's the capacity of the office that would need to be looked at because it is, it is an appreciation of a total supply chain network. Because now you're talking about you procuring, storing, distributing, and keeping records where you have to dispose of. Then you also need to look at the processes as spelled out in Ghana's procurement law in terms of its disposal. So you need somebody who appreciates the total supply chain network and to be able to manage the process. So I think it's all about capacity really. Yes, and if you talk about capacity building, I think it's beyond the persons who are employed there. So how exactly? Now, if, if you are employed as a leader of a whole department, a whole agency that is recognized by the Constitution, then one of the first things you should have is you should have the prime capacity to appreciate the overarching responsibility of what you have. You should be able to even define the strategy for what you want. And I know that in the civil service, there are professional classes. If you identify that, look, I need certain specific skills to work in my office, you will just need to request for them and they will be posted to you. So it's an appreciation of the office, what the roles are, and who are the key staff that I need to fill in all these positions and empowering them to be able to deliver what is expected of them. And if all those things are not checked, then we will be visited with this problem every four years, I, I can assure you. Mm. you. And I know you've been in the public civil service for some time now, for some years now. What, what per your experience, what is the practice and what can be learned from what you know and applied in, in this case, for instance? The, the procurement and supply chain function within government business should be empowered and uh, they should be given a free hand to drive the process. Now, you, you, you will be surprised to note that some of these vehicles, most of these vehicles we're talking about, the processes that we use in even procuring them is not in consonance with the procurement law we have in this country. Somebody will say to you that vehicles don't fall under goods or doesn't fall anywhere under the law. Procurement, by the virtue of the fact that we're spending public funds, we will need to subscribe to the procurement law, and many a time that is where we have the challenge. Disposal of these things, the procurement law is also very clear as to the means of the means to dispose of these items, and as to whether we also follow them to do it. I'm not too sure. Else, we will not also be having some of these challenges that come to say that vehicles have been sold and nobody could tell where they are. So would you say that the private sector has the best practices? I would say that, you see, the private sector at times come up on this. Why? Because the shareholders 
money, they would want to protect it. Whereas here, the governance system in terms of the public appreciating the kind of questions we need to ask in terms of the way money, our monies are spent are not asked. We tend to politicize it. So then the, the reality of what we want to do uh, disappears. But when you talk about systems and practices, you find them in the public domain. And I would have thought that we should be using them to help us achieve better results. If you look at the public procurement law we have, it is a very good document. Are we implementing it? I have my opinion about <laughs> that. And, <laughs> and I know you talked about empowerment, but beyond empowerment, how else can we deal with this problem? We need to empower them, and then the recruitment processes of procurement professionals into the civil service and the public service should be free of any interference because there is a professional qualification Hold for... Hold your horses there. Any, uh, any you, you just used the word, any interference. What kind of interference? Interference, i.e. where maybe you, people might be asked to recruit um, uh, fellow colleagues who are not qualified to be leading in procurement. If you do that, the first thing you do is you, you create a whole disconnection between the total process. And then straight away, it, it gives in to total losses of our uh, public funds. And for me, I think that is the first thing we will all need to look at before anybody is recruited into the procurement department. We have the poly we have the sorry we used to have the polytechnics running procurement now we have the technical universities we have other universities also running even up to master's degree mm -hmm. so we have the qualified people around it is about time that we try to do the right thing um, I said those and I know currently we're working on uh, we have the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply in Ghana. Ghana is also riding to get uh, a law to form the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply, which would eventually be licensing, uh, practicing procurement officers. So if you don't qualify eventually, then you would not even have the opportunity to mm. practice. When I was back in a civil service, one of the things I do is if you are not certified as a procurement professional, you don't get in at all. And beyond this, I know there used to be refresher courses for people working in areas like you're talking about. What became of, of, of those courses? Um, I know, yes, I know the Public Procurement Authority designed some short-term programs, but um, to be honest, I don't know where they're taking it to now. But I, I think it's an opportunity for also, uh, we have few consultants around who might have to start thinking about developing programs to help um, upscale the quality of delivery in terms of procurement and supply chain in the country. Your recommendations, Dr. Waters? Uh, my recommendations as we move forward is that the government should really consider the question of owning all these vehicles. Um, I have a bit of a worry when the government tends to own, we heard about 641 vehicles the previous government released to this new government. But my question was, do we have to own all these and put them in our documents and eventually we decide to sell them to politicians and other civil senior public servants? Um, after four years, a vehicle if you ask the auto houses, we'll tell you it is not that bad to sell at a residual rate. So for me, I think that as we move forward, the government should be thinking rather in the direction of leasing vehicles for use. So that after four years, what you would have paid will be the operational expenditure to the auto houses. The capital expenditure which we spend in buying them wouldn't have been spent. Government will be making a lot of saving 
after four years, if you want to change the vehicles, you return them to the auto houses and you uh, get new ones. The only weakness and disadvantage of this is politicians will not be getting vehicles to buy on auction again. Civil servants cannot buy vehicles allegedly where they keep at home waiting for the four years to ride for them to buy it themselves. These opportunities will not be there again. But that should say the national purse. Yes, that is what you will say because that is not where you and I are sitting. <laughs> but I'm not too sure whether it will go well with them. If it is, then I will say that that is what we have to do. And it takes a lot of pressure of the government so that at the end of the four-year period, if you are transiting, there are no vehicles that uh, the transition team will have to work on. Auto houses would have collected it. Everything goes away and there is nothing to deal with. And the same thing can apply even to the government bungalows. Because currently we sell the properties and what we see happening is individuals buy the, uh, the properties dilapidated and then what we want to do is we break it down and we build our own property. I would have thought government would rather have to go into a build operate, build, own, and operate. But then it's dedicated for ministers, or so it's a ministerial enclave. You build, we will rent it for our ministers. If you know more a minister, you pack away. And government doesn't own it. So the huge expenditure in terms of managing all those assets just disappeared. And then the government can make savings and possibly we can channel some into other ventures. Your uh, final words, Doc. I wish, um, I, I know you have a very wider listenership. I wish, uh, as we move forward, the government could create uh, a dialogue or a discussion to look at other options uh, in terms of procurement and move away from this traditional buying and owning vehicles into looking at other more flexible options which are really good and help uh, save for the public purse. Thank you very much. And you were just watching uh, this discussion with me. And Dr. Ted Afutu Waters, he's an international consultant, competition law and private partnership. And we've been talking about transition and procurement. And he's basically saying that probably it's time government moved on from outright purchase of vehicles to leasing to save the country some money.